So, hello, hello. This is Joy Foster, founder of Tech Pixies, and I am delighted to be joined tonight by Bill Burnett, the author of Designing Your Work Life, and he wrote this book with Dave Evans. So, Bill, we are delighted that you're here. Um, I have so many questions, and I know you're going right. to take what. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to see the book. I mean, it's it's just coming out, I think, next week in uh, the UK, and uh, I've only seen pictures of it. So I'm, I'm it's nice to know that it's a physical thing. Yeah, look, and I've already destroyed it with lots of lines <laughs> and crossing out, and you know, so I've 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 been enjoying it. Um, so you have a history uh, at Apple. You are at Stanford. Uh, you have uh, been involved in building the first Slate computer. Talk to us about your life before designing your life and designing. Yeah, your life. well, you know, I, I, I've spent most of my career in industry. I, I, I went to Stanford as an undergrad and I came back and I got my graduate degree there. And I, I and now I get to run the program I graduated from, which is kind of weird and cool. But, um, you know, I, used to, I started my career in the toy industry. I was doing Star Wars toys when the movies first came out, which was awesome. Uh, at a company in uh, Ohio called Kenner Toys. If you remember, did you have an Easy Bake Oven? I probably did. <laughs> Spirograph, Easy Bake Oven, Play-Doh, all the great toys came from Kenner and then they were doing the Star Wars stuff. And I came back, you know, came back to my graduate degree to Silicon Valley, stopped at a bunch of startups and, and then worked at Apple for seven years. Um, but all that time, you know, after my graduate work, they asked me to come back and teach uh, like a, a, just a, a seminar on illustration because I, I drew pretty well. And then they said, oh, would you teach this other class? And, and so every, every year I would just teach one class. And I did that for about, I don't know, 25 years. And then David Kelly, who's the senior guy, a uh, uh, senior academic, and also the, the guy who started IDEO, the big you know, international consulting firm, and the D School, he, he called me up in 2006 and said, hey, I need, I need some help. Have you ever thought about coming in full time you know, and, and doing this? And I was looking for something interesting to do. And so with a a hefty 60% pay cut. I joined the ranks of the academics. Um, and, uh, and it's been really wonderful because my thing was like, okay, if, I go, if I'm going to do this full time, it's all about putting you know, smart designers in the world who want to work on the hard problems. So my, my goal was a thousand, to graduate a thousand kids in 10 years. And we've actually vastly exceeded that now. And I'm on year 13. But um, so I never had any plans to be a career academic, but it's turned out to be just absolutely wonderful. Stanford's obviously a pretty fun place to teach. And then about now, you know, I don't know, 2007, 2000 or so, Dave Evans and I got together. I knew Dave from some other business things. And he'd been teaching a class over at Berkeley on careers and career finding. And he said, hey, what, what about doing something like that at Stanford? And I said, well, let's do it around design because clearly des you know, designing is the way we're going to figure out our lives. And we put that class together and it got, you know, to be very, very popular. And now it's probably takes up more time than my day job. Um, but it's been super, super interesting to try to apply the ways designers think about coming up with new to the world things like, you know, iPhones and stuff. I wasn't at Apple when we did the iPhones, but I did the, we, I worked on the team that did the very, very first laptop computers. We call them power books in those days. And, um, you know, the same way you invent something new in the product space or the service or experience space is the same way you invent something new, like the next thing you do in your life. Um, you build prototypes, you brainstorm, you, you know, you have empathy. We, in our process, we always say we don't start with the problem. We start with people, go out and get empathy for the people you're designing for. And so in this case, it's empathy for yourself. We've got lots of tools for figuring out like, well, what do you really want to do? And then empathy for the world. Cause just cause you want to do something doesn't mean the world needs it. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, be great if everybody could just do what they wanted and get paid for it, but that's not the way it works. So it, it's been it's been really fun. Um, you know, we started with students at Stanford, and then we started doing workshops with you know mid career folks, twenties and thirty somethings. We've done stuff with people who are retiring. In fact, probably the next book will be called something like "Designing Your Retirement" or your "Designing Your Encore Career." Um, because people just don't have a lot of good tools for figuring out, you know, what they would like, figuring out what they want to do, what work is meaningful to them. Everybody's, everybody's looking for, you know, some meaning, some impact, some purpose in their lives. It doesn't all, always come from work, but there has to be something in, in your world that makes you feel like it's worth getting up in the morning. So it's been a really fun, it's been really fun you know, to develop this whole curriculum and the, and, the, and the books and stuff. And now after the, 
after the Designing a Life book came out, um, our editor uh, at Knopf and also the editors at uh, Chattel Windus in the UK said, hey, do you have another book? And we said, well, let's dive into the world of work because people are really unhappy at work. You know, the, the, the stats are terrible. They're, they're well, your around. stats were interesting because you said, um, I've got it here. You said that 69% of American workers are disengaged from their work. And then you said in the UK, it's even worse with the figure as high as 89% actively right. disengaged yeah isn't that horrible people are getting yes. up on monday morning and going oh i gotta go to work and it sucks and uh and that just shouldn't you know that's that's a problem that needs to get solved because people should be engaged in work and there should be ways for people to you know find some way of creative expression or just you know get you know feel like they're having some kind of an impact um the uh, the other two statistics i love um at any one time, 40% of your workers, if you're, maybe you're a manager and you're, or you're running a big business, at any one time, 40% of your workers are looking for another job while they're on the job. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's well, amazing. We don't have that very... problem here at Tech Fixies. It's quite funny because we have a very flexible remote working environment. I mean, that uh -huh. we had that before COVID hit. And interestingly enough, um, no one's ever left unless I've had to lay them <laughs> off. And that was a horrible experience. And fortunately, I haven't had to do that for years. But we've, we've, you know, we've had a few people who've moved on when it's been time, you know, for them to move sure. on. But it's, you want to create an environment where people move on because it's the right time for them and because you've given them everything that you can give them and they actually are ready to take the leap and do something on another level from where they're at and in your current yeah. position. Absolutely. Um, but what I find really interesting about the book, many of the women who are in our program, Right. They will be in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. So uh, kind of a little bit out of the range that you're talking about. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them will have not been able to be in the traditional workplace right. because of different things. Uh, it could be that they have a child with a disability. It could be that they are the ones who are staying home with the children in order to support their husband's career, which is right. full time. Because we know that when you have a full time person in a marriage, that it's very hard for you to have kids and not have someone make a sacrifice to be with them. Unless no, that's full-time work, right? Because <laughs> raising children. Yeah, it, it's full-time work to raise the children and it's full-time work to work in a, in a big job, you know, like the ones that you're describing here. Right. So what I find interesting is that we still, what you talk a lot about in the book is about dysfunctional beliefs and reframing them and really starting to understand that you have control over your circumstances. And I think whether you are in work you, and, uh, and you're, you don't love your job, you have, you, what your argument in the book is that you have control over changing that. And we have a very similar position at Tech Pixies in the sense that maybe you are at home because your partner's working full time, but you have control over the way you think about what you're gonna do with your future and how you create a flexible work, uh, working experience that, that fits around your family. So. Right. I think we have a lot of synergy on the limiting beliefs or as you call them, dysfunctional beliefs. I love how you call that that way. Um, and we have very similar synergies in how we help people get to that point where they go, okay, where am I now? Where do I wanna be? And what's right. gonna work for my family? So um, I, I wanna talk about this, this idea of the design principles. So you in the book, you go into, um, and I think this makes a lot of sense, you go into the, the different types of, of design that you work through, um, where you try, you've listed it out as be curious, try stuff, reframe problems, which is this dysfunctional belief, know it's a process, ask for help and tell your story. Right. So can you go into that a little bit more? Tell us a little bit more about, about why the, this, that works in the design world and how it relates to designing your work life. Sure. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the mindsets of a designer, like thinking like a designer. So designers start with curiosity because what you, you can't really start with rational skepticism. If you're trying to invent something new and there's no data, you just got to get curious. And, and, and then you know, getting curious and talking to people is that, that deep dive, that empathy on what's the user situation. You know, if I'm designing a new phone or a new mouse or a new washing machine, I, I really want to understand who's using it and what are the, what are the friction points? So same thing with my my life. I mean, that, you know, I I can't get I can't get anywhere if I don't know where I want to go. So I've got to do I got to talk to people because sometimes I can't even hear myself think until I say something. And you know, I have a mentor. I have a community of people I talk with and I work with. 
it's, it's the mindset of radical collaboration, get out in the world. And, you know, that's where the answers are. Talk to those people. And then um, the try stuff is the prototyping part. You know, we, we, the, the other thing in the, in, in this book, we, we uh, have a new, a new saying, we say, set the bar low. <laughs> you know, mo most self-help books are like, be your best self, be amazing. Be, it's like, that's too hard. Let's just try small stuff at first, because the, the science, you know, all of our stuff is based on either positive psychology or some research. I, you know, I teach at Stanford. I'm not allowed to just make stuff up and say, hey, Bill thinks, you know, or Dave thinks. So if you look at the science of behavior change, most people, when they try to do stuff, they, they try something too big. And then when, and when, it, when they can't do it, they just abandon it. And, and every, you know, every piece of research says, no, take small steps. You know, if you want, if you want to run a marathon while well, you start by doing 5,000 steps a day, then you do 10,000 steps a day. Then you, you know, then you, you build up to a 1K and then a 5K. And so, you know, set the bar low, but go out and talk to people and try little, little experiments we call pro designers call them prototypes to see what works for you it's too scary to you know if, if you're a woman and, and you've been home taking care of kids and you're thinking about maybe um maybe i maybe i'll do a gig i'll, I'll do this gig economy thing I'll, I'll pick up something i'll i'll take one of your seminars and i'll figure out how to make a wordpress site and uh, do some social media and i'll put myself online well you know, that's a big project. Let's start with something really simple. Like maybe you could volunteer to blog for a friend for a week and see how you like it. Or maybe you could, you know, just try to generate, um, and get on, get on Twitter and generate, you know, 50 followers, do something small that you can actually accomplish. Cause the one thing we wanted to make sure is that people didn't try stuff in the book and then fail and feel bad about themselves. Cause that's, that's not useful. Um, so, you know, get curious, try stuff, talk to people. Um, and and uh, and then the, the tell your story part um, is is what kind of completes the loop, right? I mean, curious people who are full of that kind of curious curious energy, they're really interesting people. People like to talk to curious people. And you know, when you're telling the story of your journey, you're just inviting other people to help you. You're saying, "Hey, I tried this. I tried this. This was really interesting." And so, and you know, and people love a good storyteller. The the other real fun piece of research I found was that it was out of a, a professor in the UK who claimed that uh, storytelling increased, um, storytelling makes you sexier. Storytelling increased your ability to pass on your genes because everybody likes a good storyteller, right? So telling your story gets other people engaged with your journey. And our experience is most people are pretty helpful, right? Yeah. People want to help, they want to help other people who are on an interesting journey. So all of those are also just part of design mindsets. Um, David Kelly would, would say it's not, nowadays it's not enough to just invent something new. You have to tell the story of why this new thing creates a world you know, that's, that's gonna be so amazing that you really, really want it. So designers have to be storytellers. I love that so much. I just, we have lived in similar places, California, Boston. Um, and, but, you know, I think it's interesting because working in Britain, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. a different way of thinking. Uh, sometimes and um, and and sometimes I feel like I'm importing America uh, in terms of you know positivity and you know um, thinking differently and reframing uh, limiting yeah. beliefs, yeah. but I I don't think it's an American thing. I think what you believe, you know, those thoughts that you um, that you think over and over and over again, they become beliefs. And right. and and the, the way you organize what you what what you experience. If you believe yeah. something, you know, you're, our, our memory is mood congruent. If we're in a good mood, we remember things well. If we're in a bad mood, we, I mean, so much of our experience is just how we frame what's happening to us, right? But you're right. So much, so much of what we do is based on how we process it and how we see it and how we handle it. And when you come through a difficult situation and you let that difficult situation bring you down, it makes it really hard to come back up and to, to, to build off of that. Um, and, and I can't go into the details, but we did have a student recently who had a really negative experience, but she's been in our program for a while. And she, I was incredible to watch her resilience because what happened was she, she started immediately reframing the situation. And you could tell that because she was 
thinking about it in a totally different way, that it would resolve itself in a totally different positive right. way than you would have if she had gone into it with the same mindset uh, that she had before reframing. And right. part of what you talk about is this, this, this reframing. So let's, let's talk even more about that. Well, you know, it's, it's like a power tool in, in design, because if you're trying to solve a problem and you just have the same data everybody else has, you'll probably come up with roughly the same solution. So you want to reframe, you want to look for different, you want to be looking for different things. And we only see what we're looking for. So go look for different things. And um, in, in, in the power, once, like, like your student, once you uh, accepted a reframe, now there's all these new op opportunities, right? Now you have freedom. Now you're not stuck anymore. You know, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the one that we like to reframe a lot is, um, you know, the, a common thing in, in, I don't know, the self-help world is, what's your passion? Just find your passion and you'll be fine. And, uh, you know, if you've got a passion, that's awesome. But the research says, uh, Bill Damon, a guy at Stanford, he runs the study, for the, center, the study for the Center of Adolescence. And by the way, adolescence goes up to 25 now. So you can, that's cool. Um, you know, he said less than 20% of the people that he surveys have an identifiable passion. Most people say, I don't know, I got a lot of things I'm interested in, but I don't know about a passion. And, and every, like I said, every question presumes some kind of worldview. If I ask you what's your passion and you say you don't have one, you think there's something wrong with you. But eight out of 10 people can, can't answer that question. So it's, it's you know, we, we're in favor of living passionately and living with curiosity and, and lots of energy, but don't worry about it if you don't have a passion. You'll figure it out, right? You'll find it in, a, in the process of just get, you know, getting curious, talking to people, telling, you know, trying stuff and telling your story. So, um, there's a lot of a lot of reframes that once you get rid of a bad idea, and you and you, you have a more open, more 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 generative idea, you, you sh you're surprised at how much you know how much energy shows up and how much how much you can actually do. And I think it's really it's you know it's really useful. A lot, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, but I'm not that creative, you know, or I don't, you know, I'm not sure I can do that. It's like. I can, and we don't have to go into all the neuroscience, but there's nothing in my brain that's not in your brain where it's equal, everybody's equally creative. Some people got shut down in school. You know, they were told they couldn't draw, they couldn't paint, or they couldn't sing. And, and we accidentally connect talent in the arts to creativity. It's not only, you know, tech, you can do creative spreadsheets, you can do creative, you know, um, debate, you can do lots of creative things. So, we, we, in, the, in our class and in the book, we really want people to sort of re, um, rediscover that they are creative, that they do have the, the, the powers and, you know, that I teach you how to be a designer, but you're the designer. I don't tell you, you know, Dave and I have a rule. We don't should on our students. We never should on anybody. We don't tell them what they should do. Uh, even in the mid-career workshops where we have, you know, 30s and 40-somethings. And, 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 you know, half, the, half of that time, it'll be women thinking about maybe going back to work or changing jobs. Um, there's a lot of questions around work-life balance and how do you do, how do you get it all, how do you fit it all in? And so the reframes really help people, I think, sort of settle down and start working on the real problem and not some, you know, problem that just can't be solved. And the real problem that you're describing is exactly what we've been talking about. It's that automatic negative thought that comes right. in it's that it's and and what it's doing and we talk at, at tech Pixies, we talk about squashing the ants you know squashing those automatic negative thoughts and adding the, we like to use the word yet i mean what i love you have a whole bunch of examples um in here of different ways that you uh reframe and i just i think i'd love to pull a few of them because they you know it's a it's a different way of doing it at tech Pixies, we we like to use the word yet so, so very often someone will say, oh, I'm too old. And so we say, well, you're not too old yet, right? Or right. I'm, uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not very tech savvy. And then it's like, well, you're not very tech savvy yet. And it's the power of when you add that word yet, it's like, oh, actually, I could be. And, and that's where the curiosity comes in. And right. I, right. I feel so lucky to talk to you about this because... I probably didn't realize um, that some of the way that we structured the course was exactly designed to do that. So mm -hmm. in our course, we have two week uh, sprints where you learn for a week and then you implement for a week. 
And we right. teach nine different pieces of technology as we go along. And so what's really interesting is by the end of a 12 week period or an 11 week period, people will have gone through several different pieces of technology and tried them mm -hmm. out. And yeah, that's, that's actually built something, right? Yeah. Which, which is cool. That's empowering. And it's amazing what the, what happens when they try something new and some of them love some things and then don't like other things. And then you discover something that you were really you know, passionate about, like you said, you, that you get really excited about and you go deeper on that. So, so here's one that you had. Um, I don't like my job and I don't know what to do. So that's the dysfunctional belief. And the reframe was you have the power to reframe and redesign any situation and any job, which I thought was really interesting because yeah. I think a lot of people are in jobs and they think, well, I can't change my situation because I've got a boss and I've got other right. constraints on me. Right. Um, there was another one, and this is one that I know my ladies need to hear. Uh, my, it's the, from, from the chapter about my overwhelm is overwhelmed. Yeah. And <laughs> dysfunctional belief was I can't possibly do all this work and I'm overwhelmed. And then the reframe is I choose my way into this and I can design my way out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, let me, let me, uh, we, I don't want to sound too, um, too, you know, California, everything is cool. Um, uh, particularly for, for the UK audience, we make a big make a big caveat at the beginning of both of those chapters. Look, if you are in a toxic workplace, if you are in a place where there's you know rampant sexism or racism or ageism or uh, you just have a you know a, a, a mean uh, boss, you don't deserve that. You deserve better. And so, just if, as soon as you can, get out of that situation. So, you know if. If, if, if something's going on that is, um, and particularly nowadays we're, you know, we're really focused on systemic racism um, with the George Floyd murders and stuff. And we're re really, really thinking about how to design um, much more inclusively than we were before. But if you're in a bad situation, you can't just reframe it, right? You know, if, if, some, if something really bad is going on. So get, get the heck out as soon as you can. And not everybody has the freedom you know, to make to make choices and, and have options. So, you know, we have to be, uh, I think we really wanna be careful to make sure that it doesn't sound like, oh, this is easy. It's not always easy. And particularly for women um, who are either coming back to the, you know, to, the, to the workforce or are having to work because they need two incomes in the household and they don't necessarily feel like they have a choice around that. That may be true, but you still have a choice of how you apply yourself to the job where you find satisfaction. Um, in, there's a, we do a lot in the positive psychology space, but then we, in this book, we also did some stuff with the work of a guy named Edward Dietschy and people who talk about intrinsic motivations, like we're intrinsically motivated to get better at stuff. We're intrinsically motivated to work together with people and we're intrinsically motivated to kind of figure out how to do something uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. So autonomy, relatedness and connectedness, we call that the arc of your career. You don't need your boss's permission to get better at your job. You don't need your boss's permission to have good relationships with the people you work with. And you don't need your boss's permission to, you know, figure out a better way to do what you do, like have some autonomy in what you do. Um, and if you're a boss, turning it back around and saying, uh, you know, and, and this, this is probably why people love working for you and, and don't leave until, you know, it's time for them to do something else. Um, you give them autonomy. You let them figure out how to, you know, you don't tell them how to do what they want to do. You let them do what the, they figure out the best way. Um, it, it's in, it sounds like it's inherently, you know, about networks of people who like working together. That's the relatedness part. And you're teaching these skills to, to women and they're building this sense of competence and confidence, right? So you're, you're already working with all the positive intrinsic motivations. The interesting experiment, by the way, is they take two groups of people and they make them solve a puzzle. They give them a puzzle, a challenge. One group, they say, just solve the puzzle and we'll time you and see how you do. And the other group, they say, we'll pay you $10. The group they pay $10 always does worse than the group that's just doing it for fun, just to see how good they can do it. So, you know, you don't, it's not even about money. It's just about how do, where do we find joy? Where do we find um, our motivation coming from? And, you know, there's some really good, good stuff in psychology. We, we, we just apply that in a way that, you know, is more more fun because it's a design, it's more of a design approach. Well, I love the story in there of the woman and I believe, you know, she'd gone to Hamburger University. She was, <laughs> <laughs> and she was, uh, and, and I love this, how you talked about how she 
made the work, you know, you could think that she was working, I guess at McDonald's because she'd gone to Hamburger University, um, but you, she, she could have come in and done the exact same thing every single day um, and stuck to the routine. But what she did was she brought flowers and put them by the till. And, you know, she took that little extra care to make sure that the supervisors had co coffee and tea breaks. And so I think it's really interesting that story. Tell us a little bit more about that story. Well, yeah, and, and you know, we're not allowed to use names like McDonald's and stuff, but yeah, this is, you know, I, because the other thing is, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, you guys are professors or you guys are working in high-tech jobs, so you've got lots of freedom, they bring you free food and stuff. Well, I mean, she, she worked in a fast food restaurant, you know, she, she worked in a place like a McDonald's where you are told what to do, you're told when to clock in, when to clock out, and everything is organized, you know, around, around the tasks. But that's not really how we work, right? I mean, you know, and, and she noticed that, wow, when we change shifts, there's all this chaos and people don't, you know, the, the old shift doesn't clean up and the new shift have to, has to start with a, a mess and that's not okay. Yeah, and then just doing things like, you don't need anybody's permission to bring flowers to work. You don't need anybody's permission, you know, to get people together off the clock to chat about how we could make this place a better place. So she just decided, she just decided that she had the autonomy to do that. And even in an environment where, you know, mostly you would think people don't have any choice, she, she demonstrated that she had choice. And that's why we wanted that story in there, because it's not just about, you know, I've got a great knowledge worker job and, you know, here in Silicon Valley, you can get the free food every day and you can get the free, you know, laundry. It, it's not that. It, anybody can do it. Any, anybody can find a way to exercise some choice. You know, um, Viktor Frankl's uh, book, Man's Search for Meaning. I love that book. You know, you know even he, his point is, even in the worst of all possible situations, what could be worse than a Nazi concentration camp? If you, if you continue to hold on to your human ability to choose, mm -hmm. you can survive anything. Even if your choice is just to tell the guards, "Not today. I'm not. I'm not going to be a good. I'm, I'm not going to be a good person." And the people who gave up and who just felt they had no choice at all were often the ones who, you know, didn't survive. Well, now, that's what I he mean, said, didn't he? He said, I, he, he got, in the book, he says, I could tell who wasn't going to make it just by the way that they were approaching the situation. Now, you know, it's, it's a, he had a phenomenal spirit, you know, to, to survive in that situation and then create the, the work he did after that. But, um, and that's an extreme situation, but boy, you know, I mean, most, most jobs, you know, look, <laughs> you know, you're not happy and you think your boss is mean, but your boss isn't happy because he thinks his boss is mean and, 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 and she's not happy because she thinks her boss is mean. And so, you know, we're all, we're all just humans trying to make this work. And if we approach it from a more of a creative point of view, like, and more of a, with a more creative potential, um, we think there's, there's, you have more control. Now, you know, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't turn a bad situation into a great one, but you can certainly, um, you know, we have a chapter called don't resign, redesign, four ways to redesign your job. And most of them don't even require, you know, your boss's permission. But part of it is, um, and this, this is, you know, Viktor Frankl brought to him by you know, Frederick Nietzsche, Nietzsche's thing is like, I can deal with almost any how if I know my why. If I know why I'm trying to do this, I, I you know, give, give me any situation, I, I, can, I can make it work. So the example in the book was the guy who was working for a company and um, it got bought and turned into a terrible place to work and stuff. But he had a son who was really ill and he needed the health insurance. And so, his, so he changed his mind and he said, okay, I'm not working for job satisfaction. I'm working for my son. And I'm not going to just phone it in because I don't want to be a bad employee, but I'm going to do, I'm going to make a really clear distinction between what work is about and what, you know, caring for my son is about. And that gave him, you know, all the energy and, and uh, motivation he needed. And then the situation, you know, a year later, the situation got better. And, you know, had he, had he actually quit or something like that, it would have been terrible. So, you know, we have a lot of, like you say, you know, getting rid of these negative thoughts. I, I like the expression, you know, killing ants. Um, uh, we're, you know, the, the oldest, but worrying is just rehearsing for failure. So how about let's, let's rehearse for some success in our life. And, yeah, and I, I totally, 
when you talk about that, that's so true. It's, and someone pointed out to me that worrying is literally creating a future that doesn't exist, an undesirable future that does not exist. That's over, and over, over and over and over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, getting neuro coaching um, certified by Dr. Shannon Irvin. And that's where I learned about the squashing your ants. And what I love about, you know, the way she teaches as well is what you focus on grows. And that's what she says. She says, you know, if you create this undesired, uncreated future and you focus on it over and over again, that's what actually happens versus if you create a desired future that you want and you focus on that over and over and over again, guess what else happens? That happens. And I, Bill, I'm curious what you think about the pandemic and how this has impacted people because you may not notice this, but my ladies will probably notice this. Um, if they're watching it, I've had my hair done today and I ah. haven't had my hair cut or done anything to it in about seven months. Oh, it's, it looks very nice, very neat. You know, Thank very you. Clean. I have not gone to the, the, the I'm kind of been to a barber in four months, so yeah, I'm a little shaggy. Well, <laughs> my, my son can actually see. He looked like, you know, Alf, and then now he can see. <laughs> But I, but for me, um, it was interesting. I'm sitting there and, and, you know, I, I think partly because everyone's on masks, it's not so comfortable to talk and everything like that. Anyway, right. there was a guy who is a couple kind of stalls down for me because you got to have this socially distanced stuff. Right. And I, I heard him talking about the pandemic and right. I heard him talking about his job and I just listened and I thought, gosh, there really are two ways of thinking in life, right? There's two ways of thinking. You can either create this, you can either worry about this future that doesn't exist and create something that is undesirable, or you can, you know, go down the other way, which is what I recommend you do. Uh, I think you would recommend that too. And his conversation was, was so interesting. It was like listening to someone and you just knew it was really not going to work out for him. Like he had resolved, he had, he basically was like, oh, well, I took three months off, you know, to do something. He wanted to do something for three months, like take a break from work. He wanted to take a break from, from work for three months and then COVID hit and then he couldn't work at all. And then he had taken, um, he took uh, unemployment in order to like cover the bills. And then he said, but then now I'm trying to go back to work and everyone's trying to go back to work. And I've been off for seven months and everyone's been only been off for three months. So I'm competing against people who haven't been off as long as I have. And you could just see the spiral yeah. and you could just see it. And I just, you, you, and I was just watching him continue to build and build and build and build on this totally invented reality that, that he was choosing to believe. Yeah. And, you know, and occasionally he'd say, but it'll all work out. It'll all work out. And, you know, that kind of gave me some hope, but I thought the, the reality is he really genuinely believes that for having four months off versus three months off means he's, he's not got the same skill set as someone who's taken a shorter period of time off. Right, right. And I see this happen with tech pixies all the time where, you know, we have ladies who will be out of work for two years and we'll have ladies who've been out of work for 20 years let's say they were both in high powered careers before they took those career breaks. Right. And what I have to say to them is you have incredible skills from that career previously. That doesn't mean that those skills don't exist. You, you can't erase those years of negotiating no. and no. conversations of, you know, pacifying and all that. You can't, you can't erase that. So I mean, build, some technology changed, but that's all. You can learn that. Yeah, well, exactly. But you, you, yeah. you build on you build on what you've got, you know, and you and you build on the one Lego block at a time, really. And you you try and build a future that towards a future that you want. And I love what you say about the lo, lower the bar, right? Yeah. Those those and I say this to the ladies all the time. Your your wins. So in our Facebook group, when they have a win, we ask them to post it. Like for example, if they got you know, let's say a famous person replied to a tweet, or let's say they hit a hundred followers we ask them to screenshot it and share it because the wins, when you, when you recognize that you're winning on a regular basis, you start to feel successful before you're successful. And then all of a sudden you are successful and you're like, well, how did I get there? Because you were constantly appreciating the, the progress forward. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think, well, I mean, look, the, the COVID crisis is, is, this is, this is pretty unprecedented. And, and I do go through periods of, you know, just feeling sorry for myself, or this is terrible, and I don't like it, and stuff. 
But um, Dave and I did a couple of uh, videos on this. And one of the, the first step in, in the designing your life process is accept. You got to decide you want to work in something, right? I mean, we all have friends who've been complaining about their boss or their job or their whatever for years and years, but they never do anything. So the first step is accept. And in this COVID crisis, you know, we've left whatever normal was before. We can't really see where, where it's going to all get better again. And we don't know what better again looks like. So we're in this weird transition zone. And if you think about and, and some people have framed it as like, well, we're just, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for this to be over. Well, you might wait, you, you might be waiting a very long time. And it's really hard. So, so you know, it, it's really a time to double down and accept. Like, what, what, what can I do? I can't solve the COVID problem. Um, I can't solve the economic crisis that comes with it. Um, but I can accept into what, what I can do, you know, for, for me, it's like trying to figure out how to teach all of my classes at Stanford online and make them not a bad version of a good class, but a better class. How can I, how can I use technology and other things to make it a better class? So, I mean, it's that same thing of going back to, well, what can you choose to do? You can choose to worry about the future and everybody's going to fall into that a little bit. That's, that's okay. That's human. Um, and, or you can choose to, to try to, you know, figure out what you can do now to be more resilient, to be more prepared, to be ready for when things are, are different, uh, to take advantage of, of the difference now. You know, it's interesting, we're going to, we do, uh, we certify coaches and um, we had a bunch of planned, we had four or five coaching certifications planned, they all got canceled. So we've decided to do it online. And what Dave and I have discovered in recording all of the information is we now have this amazing asset of all these recordings of us teaching kind of master classes on each of the modules, which you didn't have before. So now all the coaches who are coming and all the coaches who are already certified have this resource. So there are ways of making you know, this better than just accepting it to be crappy. Um, so we, we talk about, you, know, you can be oppressed. You can, you can do the oppressed suppress, uh, acceptance. Oh, this is so horrible, but I guess I have to accept it. You can suppress the acceptance. You can be like, I'm just going to tough this out. And this isn't going to beat me. COVID's not going to beat me. But it's hard to sustain those. <laughs> so the generative acceptance is, okay, grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change. You know, I mean, we're not saying new stuff here. This has been 3,000-year-old wisdom traditions from every wisdom tradition in the world. Grant me the serenity to accept what I cannot change, but give me at least the agency to do something to move forward. Mm. Um, and, you know, and, and acknowledge that this is, this is hard on people. Um, I'm kind of a natural introvert and I like being by myself, but this has been too much by myself time. Dave is an incredible extrovert and just cannot stand being not with people. So this is really driving him crazy. Um, but uh, you know, each, everybody gets through it the, the way they get through it. The, the, the always thinking about things being bad, most of the stuff I've read, you know, what that's coming from is fear. We're just, a, we're just afraid of the future or we're afraid of failure or we're afraid of trying something new. We all are. I mean, it's just, it's just a natural human thing to protect ourselves and, and you know, that fight, flight or freeze response triggers every time something new comes along. Um, and I've always said courage is action in the face of fear. It's not like you're not gonna be afraid to try something new, but you're gonna try it anyway because you can learn courage. And so I what? think you, you got, you gotta, you gotta, you know, this is a pretty good time, you know, for, you know, for that, that great, you know, English spirit of just like, you know, let's, let's just pick ourselves up and move on. Right. Keep calm and carry on. I think. Keep that's calm and carry on. British. Right. That's, that's the British so, thing. Better yeah. than you're doing better than we are. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, that's, you know, it's so interesting. We won't go there, but uh, there's a great book. You may have heard of it um, by Jennifer Allwood called fear is not the boss of you. And she, she describes fear very similarly in the sense that she says, uh, you know, basically you you get confidence from doing from having the courage to do something and realizing you didn't die and right. i think that's you know that when you realize you didn't die it's like oh okay well let's try that again and you know and another thing that i've learned over the years which i think um really resonated with me when when i finally heard it was and understood it was nine times out of ten when you try something for the first time it's going to fail and if you know that going into it 
then it relieves a lot of the stress because you're like, okay, we're just trying this. We're just going to see what happens. And then you go from there. And there's so much relief in knowing that it doesn't, you don't have to get it right the first time. And you're probably not going to get it right the first time. And that's why the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth, et cetera, times get better and better. And, um, you know, I, I think it was the, the, the light bulb moment, you know, when yeah. creating the light bulb, it was like, well, I, I, I now have a thousand ways I know not to build a light bulb. <laughs> yeah, yeah, famous Thomas Edison quote. But, you know, that's, that's what our idea is like prototyping. You, so you, we build failure immunity by just building lots of prototypes. I mean, look, when, when we were making the first laptops at Apple, we had no idea what they were going to look like. No one had ever made a really skinny, thin computer before. They were big boxes. And we built hundreds of prototypes to figure it out. And, and at a certain point, a guy named John Krakauer came up with the idea of putting the keyboard in the back and the, you know, the mouse in the front. It's like, wow, whoever thought of that? Same thing with the iPhone. I mean, it, you build stuff just to try stuff out. And, it, you know, like you're not going to get it right on your first prototype. You're not going to get it right on your second prototype. That's not what they're for. They're for learning. And, 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 and this is, you know, this goes back to, you know, Carol Dweck's growth mindset. If you're, if you're, if you think, you know, well, I can't, I'm not good at math or I'm not good at, you know, at technology, then you've already talked yourself into a situation where you can't learn. So that, that's required you know, reading for the tech pixies. They have to read that book. <laughs> so, it's a great book. I, when we like I, that one and we do, uh, we do stuff with Angela Duckworth's book on grit, you know, because, because it's not just enough to have a grow, you know, open mindset. You got to work hard to get good at stuff. You got to work hard and gritty people are more successful than less gritty people. Right. So there's no, there's no I mean, design thinking isn't magical thinking. It's hard work to invent new things, including inventing your life. Um, but it's, what else you got to do? <laughs> like, you know, Jesus, you wanna sit around in that seat while they're cutting your hair talking about how the world is going to hell and it's gonna be bad. I mean, sometimes you do, cause you just need to vent. But, um, you know, get a nice new haircut and go out and change the world. That's my plan. I get a haircut and change the world. That's exactly Good. my plan. <laughs> There's another great book that's come out in the last year uh, by Marie Forleo called Everything is Figure Outable. I don't know if you've read that book, but that is- I love just, the title. <laughs> oh, it's a brilliant book. And she, um, she, her, I think she lived in the Bronx and her mother uh, was, you know, she had a low paying, low tech job, but she worked all the time, but she was one of those women that just figured stuff out, right? And so I think uh, one day Marie came home from school and her mother was was trying to fix it it was like an alarm clock and you know she was really trying to fix it and work with it and do it and you know and Marie couldn't figure it out kind of like why why are you spending so much time trying to fix this and she goes Marie everything is figure outable and she said for her that's when the penny dropped that's when she worked out that she could figure out anything I mean and she's built a multiple eight figure um, business and, uh, you know, helping m many women and men um, get businesses going online. But I think, you know, she just has had this mentality her whole life that everything is figure outable yeah. and that there is a solution to everything. And this also comes down to, you know, abundance mindset and, you know, uh, playing to win, not playing, you know, so that you don't, you don't lose, you know, yeah. it, there's, there's so many ways you could, could look at, uh, this positive thinking, but it's not just about, it's not just about being positive, but it's about really embracing, you know, there, there are more opportunities out there. I mean, what's been incredible for me is um, I was, I was speaking to a friend today and we were talking about pitching his business. And mm -hmm. he said, you know, people just won't pay for this. And I said, but people have paid you for this. So you just haven't found more people who will pay you for this. It's understanding that people will pay for something that they care about. You just have to find them. And right. it, you know, it's a numbers game. There's people that want your services and it, you've got to do the, you've got to get the numbers. You got to meet, you know, you got to go find the people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you got, and you got to deliver some kind of an exceptional service. We have a, you know, it's a book on work. So, um, we put a chapter in about gig working and you know kind of doing your own thing and whether you want to do that on the side or you whether whether you have to do it because you, you lost your other you know your other gig um you know creating an exceptional service is a design problem you know making making you know people who 
create, get, make exceptional offers, get exceptional clients. And if you want to get paid more than everybody else for what you're doing, you know, design the best possible version of whatever your service or, or product or experience is. And so we put a thing in there because I always insist that every book teaches one real design tool. We did, we did brainstorming, mind mapping, and, and uh, a couple others in the first book. In this book, we, we talked about what, what's called a journey map. Where you, you, you do the journey of the whole, you know, the customer figures out what they want, then they find you, and then they try your service, and then they, you know, you have them for a little while, and then they leave. And what's that whole journey like? And how can you make magic moments at every one of those, those you know, points of, of potential friction? And I mean, that's how designers are designing apps and, and other things to just be, you know, have you noticed that things have gotten better designed lately? Yeah. That, that, and, and we have very low tolerance now for, for crappy software or crappy, you know, design, which I think is great. Um, I'm surprised at how much stuff is still badly designed. I don't know why, like we know better, but um, yeah. So, you know, it, people will exchange value for things of value. Sometimes that's money, sometimes that's influence, sometimes that's impact, sometimes that's other things. But um, and but that comes design. back to if you don't believe that what you have to offer is valuable, no one else will believe it either. Right. And I think that is so important. I think you've got to believe that what you are offering is valuable. And I will tell you from having been running Tech Pixies now for five years, I did not start to understand the value of it until very recently. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has reflected in the, the, the growth of our business. And as soon as I figured out that what we were doing was really valuable and, and I didn't know, you know, it was so funny every time we ran. So I run this program 21 times and every time I ran it, I, I would get nervous and I would pray like, heck, you know, please make sure this changes ladies' lives. Like I, you know, I, it worked the first time, it worked the second time, it worked the third time, it worked the fourth time. But for so many, every time we went through a new iteration, the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, all the way up to 20, but probably around 17, maybe around, at around 17 iterations of our course, I thought, okay, it works. You know, once I'd had a couple hundred women through the program, okay, it works. And you know what? It's the same program with a few tweaks that I ran with 12 women five years ago. Right. And it's just as valuable now as it was then. But if I don't believe it's valuable, then no one else is going to believe it's valuable. Right. And I think right. when someone's creating a service or a product, if they don't think it's valuable, you know, that's going to reflect and it's going to be hard to sell that service or product, even if it's exceptional, but it's not going to be exceptional if you don't personally think it's exceptional. No, I agree. I mean, I, I, um, sometimes when I'm coaching, um, some of my students want to be entrepreneurs and, and, they all, and they all want to be the designer. They don't want to be the business person or the salesperson. Or the, I, and I'm like, okay, who's going to ask for the check? I go, what do you mean? Go, who's going to ask, you know, a venture capitalist to give you a million dollars for this idea? Because if you're not willing to ask, no one's going to give it to you. And it's surprising, particularly designers are like, well, I, you know, I, I think it's really good, but I don't know if it's worth anything, right? And, so, and, and this, this notion that um, if, if you don't think it's worth something, the world isn't going to show up and just decide to give you money. You, you have to ask for the check. And uh, I think you're, uh, you know, it, 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 takes some, it takes some time to sort of figure out, well, what's, you know, like what, what is it that's valuable that I'm doing? But, um, but boy, once you have that confidence, things really change. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You are so right. And it's such a beautiful thing to see that change. And also, you know, to start to see the momentum come from that change. And, you know, and I'm, I'm experiencing it as a business owner um, where I, I have full confidence in our program because I, but I find it interesting that I had to wait until a couple hundred women said that it worked instead of just going with the fact that <laughs> 10 women said it worked. I had to wait till, you know, we have 450 women now in the program and it's such a beautiful thing to see it work. And I don't worry about that anymore. I yeah. don't go to bed worrying, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Because now I'm at the place where I'm like, you know what? If they do the work, if they watch the videos, if they apply what I teach, it's going to work. Just like if your coaches watch your videos, they apply what they learn, it's going to work. Because you've, you've got enough experience, you've worked with over a thousand students, you, you know, well, more than that now, but you know, you know the methodology works, you know that it's good, and then you start to value that. Um, I want to thank you for your time. 
Uh, I also want to um, ask you to leave us with some parting advice or wisdom uh, for you know the women going through our program um, who are returning to work, changing careers, starting a business. I mean, this whole podcast is full of incredible information, but if, if you could leave them with like one impactful thought, what would that be? Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, we've talked about a bunch of different stuff that I think is useful and the, and the, you know, the, you know, uh, get curious, talk to people, try stuff, tell your story is, is, is a good model. But so one, one other thing, cause I, I touched on a little bit, trust your creativity. There was a five or six or seven year old little girl who was amazingly creative and, you know, could take a, 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 a toy and a, and a, spoon and a something and make an entire world out of it, right? An entire fantasy world with a blanket and a, and a, and a chair. So trust your creativity because it's in there. Somebody might have told you you're not creative, but that's not true. And I, I can prove it to you with neuroscience. I can prove it to you with any number of different ways. But if you, if you build what, what David Kelly calls creative confidence, he wrote a book called Creative Confidence. And that's what we, I think that's what we're doing. You know, if we do anything well at, 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 in my program at Stanford, that's what we're doing. We're, we're rebuilding the creative confidence of our young students. Um, because from, from creativity, from that sense that I'm a creative person, that I can change the world, that you know, something that doesn't exist could exist simply because I thought of it. And then I worked really hard to make it true. If you, if you, if you have that experience, and again, set the bar low, try little experiments with your creativity. But once you're, like just like when you you hit you know section uh, set uh, uh, set number seventeen you know times you did your program you realize hey this is really worth it <laughs> you know like once you realize I am actually a creative individual and I can solve any problem you know everything is is doable um, then um, we've we've just watched the, the, David calls it the flip we watch students who come into our, our you know the D school. They come from a business school background or a, a technical background or something, and they don't think they're creative. And, and there's a period of time somewhere in the class where they flip and they go, oh, my God, you know, like I am creative. I, like I just came up with a really good idea. Trust your creativity because it's in there. And the more you work on it, I mean, we spend a lot of time in our culture, you know, educating our, our rational brain and at that much time educating our creative brain. So spend time there because it's a really fun place to be. And it's an incredibly powerful way of solving problems. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time. I just want to remind everybody, the book is called Design Your Work Life. And it says how to thrive and change and find happiness at work. So um, definitely get your hands on the book. It's so nice to speak to someone uh, who reinforces the teaching that we do at Tech Pixies. Uh, and particularly when they uh, run a program at Stanford, it makes me feel even better about <laughs> about the work we're doing. Um, Stanford is one of those places where unashamedly I would have loved to have gone as a student. Uh, so it's, it's quite special to get to spend time with someone who uh, is a big part of that university. So thank you very much for your time and all the work you do uh, to make sure that young people are discovering this creative side of themselves and remembering that it's there so that they carry that into the decades later on in their life. And hopefully yeah. we can do the same thing with women coming through our program. Well, thank you so much for the time. And, and I think you were running an, an amazing program and we do have a lot of things in common. So keep doing what you're doing. It's good work. Thank you. Thank you so much.